Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Today I want to focus on two critical matters. Is the collegium system for choosing judges perfect or should it be scrapped? And are the powers of the Chief Justice of India as master of the roster something that need to be urgently reviewed? Joining me now to have a reflective discussion on these subjects is India's former Chief Justice, Justice Uday Umesh Lalit. Justice Lalit, in a series of interviews recently, you described the collegium system as perfect. In which case, how would you describe the system that operated before 1993 when appointments were made by the President in consultation with some or several judges of the Supreme Court? Several prominent judges that India have known were products of that system, including the present Chief Justice's father, who is in fact the longest serving Chief Justice. So how would you describe that system? See, both the systems, according to me, are geared to achieve one single purpose and that is to have the best possible talent in the country to be garnered, to be nurtured and to be taken to the courts, correct, as judges of the court. It is true that the earlier system was absolutely productive. Brilliant judges were selected by the executive, of course in consultation, quote unquote, as it was understood in those days with the Chief Justice. And one can't say that there were any areas of complaint that perhaps I think the assessment of the executive or the consultation with the Chief Justice was fractured on any count. I do accept that the earlier system did produce wonderful judges, brilliant judges, and there was no area of complaint. But at the same time, if the jurisprudence of the country has developed in such a way that we have accepted that the collegium system would be a better of the two areas or two streams available for us. And repeatedly, judgment after judgment, at least on say three occasions, the matter had received the attention of the Supreme Court. And if at every juncture collegium system has been accepted to be the better of the two and the correct norm for the Indian scenario, then we have to accept it that one which is established as of now, one which went to the extent saying that look it, consider this way, that the collegium system which was accepted as a result of judge-made law was then made the basis to even set aside a constitutional amendment. So you are saying that the system that prevailed before 93, there was no complaint with it, but the collegium system is better. Is better. So better. there was nothing wrong with that system, but you have a better system to replace it. Correct. You, you have put it very well, sir. That, that's how I would put it this way. In 2015, the Supreme Court struck down constitutional amendments that created the National Judicial Appointments Commission and restored the collegium system. Does this mean that the Supreme Court considers the collegium system part of the basic structure of the constitution? Absolutely. So therefore, they have put it at the level saying independence of judiciary is part of the basic structure. If independence of judiciary is one of those inviolable principles which cannot even be sort of uh, uh, nullified to any extent, then to say that the NJAC would be, even by constitutional amendment, should be brought in, their lordships did not accept it. Okay, can I interrupt? 
There's no doubt and no one would quarrel that independence of the judiciary is part of the basic right. structure. Right. No one could quarrel. But does it mean that the collegium system is part of the basic structure? No, it doesn't. What they said is it would be best subserved by having this particular system where the expertise of the judges when they select these successors is of the highest order as against the model which was contemplated by NJSE, which is not just the judicial organ, but again some kind of interspersing by some of the executive members, some of the other uh, legal experts. So according to them, the model which was in existence, which would subserve the basic idea and subserve the... I want you to give me clarity, sir. There's no doubt that independence of the judiciary is part of the basic structure. But surely independence of the judiciary can be secured through many different means of choosing judges. Why, See, therefore, I, is the collegium system considered I, almost I am part not of the here, basic structure? I am not here to comment upon the wisdom or the correctness of the decision. What we go about is that since 2015, this has been a a model which has been in existence. The model has been in existence for a fairly long time. The model was sought to be changed. Even after that attempt, the judicial organ of this institution, Supreme Court, found that this particular model is subserving the basic interest in the better way. In fact, this is what you said to the Indian Express on the 14th of November. That's right. An attempt to have a different modality was not found to be correct. correct. And then you added, in fact, the court went to the extent of saying that such an attempt, even a constitutional amendment, would be a violation of the basic structure. That clearly suggests that the court considers the collegium system part of the basic structure. It doesn't consider collegium system as such. It emanates from the basic idea, independence of judiciary. How best would you subserve that was the issue. And okay. according to them, collegium system subserve the issue in a better way. Let me tell you the problem though. Yes. Nowhere in the constitution does the word collegium appear. More importantly, the collegium system is the creation of judges who insisted that the word consultation in Article 124.2 of the constitution actually means concurrence. You know and I know it does not mean concurrence and every dictionary will point out to you that the two words have different meanings. You are right, sir, that uh, the expression used in the constitution is quote-unquote consultation. Consultation was elevated to the status of concurrence in one of the judgments by the Supreme Court. But that was the idiosyncratic response of a particular correct, correct. judge. Now, now it's what not you based say, on the constitution. What you say is right that concurrence when it was elevated to that level, consultation to be meaning concurrence, at that stage, the constitution did not provide any alternative. So therefore, everything flows from the expression consultation. Today, the one of the criticism which has been leveled so far as NJSC judgment is concerned, now that the parliament in its constituent capacity speaks otherwise and says that NJSC shall be the modality, which organization or which organ shall now hereafter select or transfer judges whether you can still go by that original meaning of consultation to be concurrence and on that basis set aside a constitutional amendment. This is of course the criticism so far as those who say that NJSE could not have been set aside. Absolutely, Justice Lalit, and everything therefore hinges on accepting Absolutely, the interpretation right. of consultation as concurrence. And I don't mean to be offensive. But this determination by the Supreme Court that consultation means concurrence reminds me of Humpty Dumpty. In Alice in <laughs> Through the Looking Glass, this is what he said. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, when Lewis Carroll wrote that, it was comic. But when the Supreme Court does it, it becomes very worrying. Because the two words are different. They are not the same. And even if two or three judges decide they are the same, the judges are not masters of language. Sir, so the decision went four is to one, correct? One judge, Justice Chalameshwar, was in minority. Other four judges ruled otherwise. For student of law, and especially for a judge who is administering law, we go by the law which is in existence, which is the established norm, and which is the parameter with which we must work around. Which means four to one, four carries the day. 
Of course, yes. But it, it four does. to one carried the day on the basis of either reinterpreting or possibly misunderstanding one word of the English language. There is no way consultation means concurrence. Sir. It may be, sir. But you agree, imagine, maybe. imagine, imagine this way. That supposing if I am part of the collegium, I am actually having the meeting. Which law do I go by? I will go by the law, which is the established law. We take oath that constitution has by law established. So if constitution has by law established is the one which has been interpreted by the Supreme Court one way, and we have to go by that way. Let me point something out. The debates in the Constituent Assembly clearly showed that an attempt was made in the late 40s to include concurrence of the Chief Justice of India as part of the process of appointing judges. An amendment to that effect was defeated. Clearly, the people who made our constitution did not believe concurrence was necessary. Yet when the Supreme Court in 1993 reinterpreted the word consultation, they actually did the opposite of what the makers of the constitution wanted. So again, you know, the purpose of discussion here is what does a judge apply? What should be the law? What should be the interpretation? A judge may be called upon to consider whenever the occasion demands that. If supposing if the matter had come up before me, and I was part of the bench, which was to reconsider the matter, then certainly all these issues will be gone into. Every pros and cons will certainly be gone into. So you but would for, a, gone for a this. succeeding generation of judges, we go by whatever is the law established by the Supreme Court. So that layman can follow what you're saying, can I put it in my language? You're saying that the law established in 93 is the law by which judges have to go by. And since the Supreme Court has reinterpreted the constitution in 93, that reinterpretation will follow. No, I will, I will add one more thing. <clears throat> 1993 interpretation by the Supreme Court has stood the test of the day, even after the amendment in 2015. So it gets reinforced, not just an idea which was invented for the first time. That idea has been cemented in our jurisprudence. Once it is cemented and it becomes the structure which has to be followed, then for succeeding generation of judges, unless and until there is an occasion to change the law. Huh. That occasion, it seems from today's papers, the Hindu in particular of the front page may it have maybe It may be. It may be. I am no longer part of the court. So therefore, I can only look at it dispassionately as a student of law. Absolutely. But hmm. as a curious person, I'll ask you this. When the Chief Justice has announced on Thursday, and it's in today's papers Friday, that he's willing to accept a petition to look into the maintainability of the collegium system. That means he will have to go into this issue that you and I have raised. Absolutely. The, absolutely. Can consultation be deemed to be concurrence? And if he comes to the conclusion or that bench comes to the conclusion that it can't, then the whole thing has to be unwound. Absolutely. You are right. Everything will turn up completely upside down. And that shows the openness of the judicial organ to consider every pros and cons or even a counter idea as and when the occasion comes up. Except that if everything is turned upside down and you decide that consultation is not concurrence and therefore the collegium system does not apply because it was wrong, then what happens to all the judges and all the judgments that those judges gave from 93 onwards? Because suddenly ab initio, the system on which that they were chosen. Then, then we have part. what is called de facto doctrine. So therefore, whatever has happened, correct? Any, any kind of upsetting will be with pros prospective effect. So therefore, that part need not bother us. Okay. All that one can say is that even after 93, so therefore 7 plus 22, 29 years, and despite 2015, the Supreme Court is still open to consider whether perhaps I think the matter requires rehaul or relook in the matter. Let's establish for the audience what we've been able to agree on. 1993 gave a new interpretation of the constitution that created the collegium system. It was reinforced in 2015, which is why it continues to apply. Absolutely. But now, as of yesterday, the Chief Justice has accepted that he will set up a bench to relook, and that bench That's will right. obviously right. go into concurrence versus consultation. Absolutely. All, all the issues, all the questions will certainly be gone. So into. a question mark over the collegium system has mm, suddenly arisen. Now, no, all that one can say is that 
there is still willingness to consider. So therefore, willingness to consider naturally would mean a question mark. Ha, well, you know, question mark, but the matter will go before a court. And presumably, it will have to go before a bench bigger than a nine judge bench. Because the 93 bench was a nine-judge bench. We quite see that. So therefore, there are two ways in which the matter can reach a level where it is greater than nine judges. Number one, it climbs up from three to five, five to seven, seven to nine, and nine to eleven. A bit like a ladder. Ha, huh, like a ladder. Or the Chief Justice, going by the law laid down by Justice Lahoti in that Bahai International, or rather Bohri uh, Dawdi Bohra. In that matter, what the Chief Justice said is that the Chief Justice has the power on administrative side, even without going through that ladder from 3 to 5, 5 to 7, etc. Go straight to a ladder. He can straight away refer it to a larger bench. Okay. Huh. Let's then come back to the central question I began with, because this diversion was important because it questioned the validity of the collegium system. But the key issue I want to discuss with you is the comment you made, is the collegium system perfect or not? I'm going to quote to you what Justice Chalameshwar said in 2015. Proceedings of the Collegium were absolutely opaque and inaccessible both to the public and history. And even Justice Joseph Kurian, who actually in the end struck down the NJAC, wasn't at all supportive of the Collegium system. He said, Collegium system lacks transparency, accountability and objectivity. So very senior former judges disagree with your view that the collegium system is perfect. See, over a period of time, we have also learned from our, you know, uh, if I may use the expression past mistakes, that is precisely why the results of the collegium are now put in public domain. Results are put in public domain. At one stage, we also thought that perhaps the reasons why a particular name gets rejected must also be kept in public domain. It continued for a while, for about two years or so. We again then retracted and said that in case there is a rejection of a particular name, it need not be put in public domain. Why? A certain element of negativity gets attached to that rejection. The person concerned, if he is member of the bar, his practice gets affected. His name gets sort of affected adversely. So therefore, let us not put rejections in public domain. I can fully understand that, and that is a consideration for the privacy and the dignity of the Absolutely. individual candidate. But I'm not talking about reasons for rejection not being put in the public domain or the results being put in the public domain. What people say makes the collegium system opaque is that we don't know the basis and criterion on which candidates are originally considered nor do we know the basis and criterion on which those candidates then get selected as judges. That is where the opacity comes now, in. Now, see this. Judges are appointed at two levels through the collegial system. One at high court level and one at supreme court level. The entry... There is a third level from high court to chief justice of the high court. That too ah, that's right. That's right. But within the high courts. So the first point is that the talent which enters the judicial organ, the initiation or the entry level is at the high court level. When we are considering the person's concern, whether they are worthy to be taken as judges of the high court, the matter is actually seen at three or four different levels after which the collegium in the Supreme Court accepts the particular names. No doubt it's seen at different levels, but we don't know what is the criteria that's applied at those levels. Why criteria, don't that are, criteria are well known so far as the judicial organs are concerned. Number one, first of all, there must be age limit which is around say 45 or plus. Of course, there are few exceptions where if the exceptional candidate or his talent is such that it can be stated by the Chief Justice to be of exceptional uh, level. But on what basis? Cancer. On what basis is that judicial See, acumen judge? These, these are these are very, very few cases where below 45 people have been considered. And those are reasons which are given. They are part of the record when the Chief Justice sends the entire set of papers. What about people above 45 or 50? On what basis is that judicial acumen judge? Can't you make available no, to the I, public I will, the points that you consider? See, there is no no difficulty in making these points available. I'll just tell you what is the structure with which we go about. Say, for instance, a person who is 45 plus, we have on record, if he happens to be a lawyer, 
then how many matters where he has appeared, the judgments have been reported, the reported judgments to his credit, unreported judgments to his credit. This is one factor which is always taken into account. Second factor is what is the income level of that man? Because what is normally considered is that the income level of a person should be moderately of such level that there would not be any temptations to misuse the public office which he will hereafter be holding. I can understand that when you consider lawyers, you look at how many judgments has he got to his credit, how many are cases that he lost. But that's a test or judgment of his advocacy. He's no longer going to be an advocate when he becomes a judge. How do you judge his capacity See, as a judge? That After is all, why. How do you judge his capacity to apply the law as a judge? And secondly, to write judgments that are clear and that are convincing. That's the See, one, one has to make some kind of element of guesswork. Now take for instance, even if NJAC was there, what would be the parameter with which you will be testing the ability of a person, an advocate, who will hereafter, after being selected, will make a good judge? You have to make that element of guesswork so on the basis of two or three facets of the matter. Number one is performance in court. Now normally what happens is, under the regime that we have accepted, Chief Justice of a High Court is normally from outside. So therefore, there is an ele element of objectivity in the assessment. The person who comes from outside is part of the collegium along with two others. One of them at least will be a local person. So therefore, he will give the input so far as the profile of that man is concerned. The Chief Justice over a period of time would be testing the ability of a counsel who appears before him. He would be knowing as to the legal acumen of that man, the capacity of that man, how best does he, is he able to sort of paraphrase everything in shortest possible time, how is his advocacy, levels of advocacy, how is he effective in court. It is that basic idea which is the, if I may use the metal part, that so far as the metal is tested, metal is considered. But you're saying a very interesting thing. You admitted that there is an element of guesswork. And that element of guesswork, I presume, results from the fact that you are looking at and observing and analyzing a man's advocacy and judging from that what sort of judge he would make. There is no other way, sir. There is no other way. Supposing in case we were to say that, very well, this is a legal problem. Now I'll write a judgment on that. That will actually be like... Uh, you know, but going, you say there is no other way, but then why do two judges, both Judge Kurian and Justice Chalabeshwar, talk about opacity? Opacity is what? According to me, there is no opacity here. Everything is perfect. What at best people can say is that the criteria which weighs in individual matters is perhaps not made known to the public. Why? Why can't that be made known? Of course, yes. There is no, 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 no reason why it shouldn't be made. And it could be. It can be made. It can Let certainly be made. Let me come to a second concern with the collegium system. It arises from the fact that the collegium system operates behind closed doors, effectively in secrecy. And people have turned around and said, this leaves scope for nepotism. And you know, and I know, that over the years, there have been frequent allegations that the collegium system has ended up promoting and elevating either the juniors from chambers of judges or their relatives. Now, I won't be invidious and go into names, but again, both of us are aware whose names have been tossed around. That is another damaging allegation that judges promote their relatives, they promote their sons and daughters, they promote their juniors from their chambers. See, there have been instances, one can't deny that, there have been instances where somebody uh, who has been selected, maybe relative, of some former judge or even a current judge. So there have been such instances, but equally on the other side, there have been instances where if a name has been proposed, which apparently shows that he is related to somebody, those names are not straight away and readily accepted. Some of the names have been rejected as well by the Supreme on Court. On the grounds of relationship? Not exactly on the ground of relationship, but the relationship is not something which is considered to be a parameter with which one goes about. If the metal of that man, if the capacity of that man is not worthy of being judged, then maybe he is, a related, he is related to somebody. That factor has never weighed, weighed with the collision.
A bigger concern with the collegium system arises out of the quality of people who are either promoted or ignored. Let's take those who are ignored. There are some exceptionally good judges who have never made it to the Supreme Court. The two that come to mind immediately is Justice Akhil Qureshi and Justice Ajit Prakash Shah. And in the case of Justice Qureshi, and you know this better than me, Justice Lalit, Justice Fali Nariman actually refused to nominate further judges until Qureshi was promoted. Qureshi was never promoted and he held up the system. So obviously, even members of the collegium themselves were aware that I suppose the internal politics was stopping good men getting promoted. See, these are some of the instances, these instances, these kind of instances used to happen even before 1993. Some of the judges who are brilliant judges got excluded, maybe for one consideration or the other. It is true that these two names recently, Justice A.P. Shah's name was something which was under consideration. I was not party or privy to the, the deliberations before the, before the collegium that time. Because I was never, no, not even judge at around that time when Justice A.P. Shah's name was under consideration. But I must say that so far as Justice Akhil Qureshi's name is concerned, I was also part of the collegium when Justice Rointon Nariman did say that, you know, we must get this particular name along with other names. It is true that the collegium meetings thereafter never took place. That was in the regime when Justice Bobde was the Chief Justice. So therefore, as a result of that, by the time the next collegium meeting took place, Justice Qureshi had retired. Can I ask you a blunt question? Yes. Speaking for yourself, was it a mistake not to elevate Justice Qureshi? Was that an error that the collegium made? My personal views and the views of the collegium actually, you know, they, they perhaps I think may not meet. But at the same time, since I am part of the collegium at some stage or the other. It's a deliberative process. Some of the names which I consider to be appropriate, perhaps my other members of the collegium may not think appropriately. And in the deliberative process, which is a democratic principle where I have only one-fifth of a vote, so 20% of vote, naturally what happens during the deliberations in the collegium is something that we go about. You've answered as a diplomat, as you rightly should, but the first part of your answer gives a hint. My personal views and those of the collegium may, may not, not necessarily may not, mean. May not necessarily. I'm the audience will interpret that possibly as they want, as an I, indication of it, your answer. It, it always has to be. See, your personal view is that you consider a particular candidate to be worthy. You may consider so and so may not be so worthy. But what happens in the deliberative process is one has to give way. Otherwise, it would have been only one single individual's vote. Why is it that 1993 judgment put it that five persons who are the top judges in the Supreme Court must form a collegium and they must decide through deliberative process? So therefore, that, that is at the root of everything. But Justice Ali, it's not just that good people, deserving people sometimes get overlooked. Quite often, undeserving inappropriate people get elevated. Justice Karnan is a glaring example. He ended up in jail. But I would put to you that Justices M.R. Shah and Arun Mishra, who embarrassed the Supreme Court when as sitting judges, they publicly praised the Prime Minister and created a great sense of concern in the judiciary beyond the Supreme Court, were also inappropriate appointments. And if a system throws up inappropriate people, how can it be perfect? See, these are all their individual views. Whatever Justice Mishra or Justice Shah think about the Prime Minister, it is their view. But they shouldn't express it as judges in correct, public. Correct. It has also happened in the past. Justice Bhagwati wrote a letter to the then Prime Minister. And he got excoriated correct, for correct, it. Correct, correct. So therefore, Justice Bhagwati was one of the most brilliant judges that this court has ever produced. Correct. So you're saying judges are human beings allowed to Judges are. So therefore, leave it at that. These are their individual views. But the point I'm making is not about the individual. The point I'm making is that if a system, A, doesn't always promote the best, and B, often promotes inappropriate people, can that system be perfect? That's my real question. See, we, we have to work a particular system. Now, if there is another model which is near perfect and better than this, then certainly as and when the occasion comes, the judicial organ of the state will certainly lean in favor of that. 
at this at this particular point in time we have a collegium system and to you my think it's mind, the best yeah let me point out a paradox to you yes sir the author of the collegium system the judge who wrote the judgment in 1993 was justice varma correct just 11 years later in an interview to me for hard talk india on bbc in august 2004 he categorically said that he had changed his opinion he considered the collegium system a mistake he was now in favor of the national judicial appointments commission and the reason he said he changed his mind is that he wasn't confident the collegium system was elevating appropriate people now if the author of the system says it's a mistake and changes his mind so all this agree? all this was gone into in 2015 when the bench of five judges considered that they considered even i, re- I recollect having read that mukul rodgi who was the attorney general then then produced some tabular charts some of the names saying that perhaps i think look at the disposal look at the performance so therefore these are not the names which originally should have been considered or recommended these are of course yes there are certain flaws there are certain shortcomings there are certain infirmities but on the whole when we consider a particular system so therefore particular system which is in vogue today if there be any other alternative which is far better and superior to this then certainly as legal scholars we would certainly welcome that but isn't it a paradox that the very author of the collegium system himself it, in 10 it years decided it happens that way it happens that way so so perhaps i think there is a famous uh, speech given by justice gajendra gadkar saying that perhaps we have gone wrong on a particular you know line of jurisprudence so therefore these things do happen let me end this section of the interview with one last question if the collegium system as you repeatedly said is perfect then it follows that the supreme court should also fulfill all its requirements scrupulously and perhaps rigidly i i may make one correction here what i consider collegium system you know on the strength of material or the parameters with which it must go about theoretically is near perfect system it is true that there perhaps some of the recommendees or some of the selected candidates may not be the appropriate candidates some of the candidates but these are some of the infirmities in the system perhaps i think what one can do is one can have the the parameters of the selection to be precise parameters of the selection to be sharpened parameters of the selection to be more objective and made public as well and made made public as well and then you will have a absolutely perfect system okay let me then go back to my question if the collegium system is perfect then all its requirements should also be scrupulously if not rigidly adhered to and one of the requirements <coughs> is that and, and this requirement is absolutely central to the independence of the judiciary the requirement is that if a name is reiterated a second time the government has to accept it correct 7 days ago the supreme court revealed on the 11th of november that 11 names have been twice reiterated and the government has done nothing why hasn't the supreme court protested loudly and forcefully and insisted that the government accept these names because by not accepting those names the whole basis of the collegium system which is to defend the independence of the judiciary you're right, is you're being right. challenged you're right see the the norm which is an accepted norm is that the government may send back the name for reconsideration once but if it is reiterated then it must be accepted then why aren't these 11 now, being i'll give you two examples where it was accepted just as came joseph's name was initially suggested along with perhaps i think justice indu malotra and justice came joseph there and he was left out there, huh? and justice joseph's name was left out the matter was reiterated by the then collegium along with two other names justice indira banerji and justice vinit saran all three of them took oath around the same time or on the same day so therefore once reiterated the then government accepted it and then Justice Joseph's sort of name got cleared completely. They made completely. the second time round have accepted Justice Joseph's name, but in the process of delaying do so, they yes, reduced right. his seniority I, I know, and affected I know. his chances He, of becoming I Chief know. Justice. Not Chief Justice. 
because see the name was initially recommended along with Indu Malhotra, Indira Banerjee and Vinit Saran. All three of them have retired. So Joseph is still in court. So Joseph amongst these four was the youngest of the lot. So it is not as if somebody who is younger to him got promoted before him or was taken to court ahead but of him. But his seniority still got affected. Seniority did get affected. But let me come back to my question. <laughs> 11 names revealed on the 11th of November. I quite see that. I quite see that. So therefore, this is a matter which needs to be deliberated and sort of crystallized as a part of convention. That supposing in case the matter has been sent back by the collegium with a reiteration, then within say four weeks or within six weeks, the names must fructify. So therefore, that, that area needs to be sort of solidified, needs to be laid down with precise and great clarity. I'll be blunt, why can't the Supreme Court say to the government, if you do not clear these names which are being reiterated a second time within a flat period of six weeks, we will take contempt of court action. Theoretically possible. Theoretically possible. It's only when you do it Correct. that you will defend the Perhaps independence Perhaps I think yes, the call will be taken by the bench presided over by Justice Sanjay Kishan call. The matter is now is pending before a judicial organ, the bench itself. So they'll certainly take a call. But at the moment, let me quote to you what Justice Sanjay Kishan call said on the 11th of November. Very weak words. Such practice of withholding approval is unacceptable. Loads of things are unacceptable. Being rude to someone is unacceptable. I mean, this is a very timid response. What is being challenged is ultimately the independence of the judiciary. And sir, you know, sir, what, what that this government here? has repeatedly been doing it. It's not new. It's not a one-off. See, the reactions of a court at an intermediate stage or interlocutory stage are one thing. What will finally emerge from their decision or the, the judicially enforceable order will certainly be something, you know, which will be of interest to every legal scholar. We all hope so, but the problem is that what you call the interlocutory stage or the intermediary stage seems to be a very long stage. I, it doesn't know, seem to come know, to an end. But, but, but they are in season of the matter and they are going ahead with that. So therefore, give that leeway to that bench, the bench will certainly Happily, look into but that. You know, the cost is that in the process, people like Aditya Sondi from Karnataka have withdrawn their name. And then Mr. Kripal, Subhash Kripal, Actually Saurav, expressed, Saurav, 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 my apologies, actually expressed his understandable frustration in an interview I, to I NDTV yesterday. That. I quite see that. I quite so, see I mean, that. you're losing good people. I, you need to act fast. Yes, Aditya Sondi is one person who has withdrawn his consent, maybe as a result of the lapse of time. Because people also need to have certainty in life. So, therefore, one can't say that Aditya Sondi was incorrect. But at the same time, uh, there needs to be, there needs... Uh, clarity must be there as to and certain timelines must be prescribed and perhaps that's the area to which the bench presided over by Justice Call is alive and they'll certainly look into that. I'll end this section of the interview by repeating what I think you've said but I'll repeat it in my words not all. You are hopeful that the bench and the Supreme Court as a whole will take a tougher stand vis-a-vis -vis the government when the government deliberately delays clearing names recommended a second time. No, not exactly tougher, but a clear stand. So therefore, everybody is aware that very well, these are the timelines within which the decisions must be taken. Uh, what happens when those timelines are breached? Huh, then, then certainly, yes. Then, then toughness? Certainly, yes, yes, of course, yes. Because without toughness, clarity could be even Clarity, in clarity terms will of be weakness. useless. Absolutely, you are right. You can you're be right. pusillanimous and clear. Correct, correct. You have correct. to be tough and clear, and we are agreed on that. Tough and clear. Yes, sir. Let's leave this section of the interview there. We've discussed it thoroughly. I think now the audience must decide for themselves the issues that we've raised: a about the perfection of the collegium system, and b the bigger question: whether the collegium system was correctly created, or whether it all depends upon how you interpret one word of the English language. I'll take a quick break and come back and talk to you about the other issue I want to raise, which is the powers of the Chief Justice of India as master of the roster and do they need to be reviewed. See you in a moment's time. Welcome back to the second part of a special interview with the former Chief Justice of India, Justice Uday Omesh Lalit. Justice Lalit, let me in this second part talk to you about the powers of the Chief Justice as master of the roster. In a recent article in the Indian Express, Sri Ram Pancho said that this allows the Chief Justice to decide which cases are heard and which cases are not, the size of the bench 
and the composition of the bench. And then he concluded, and I'm quoting him, this means the Chief Justice, as the sole selector, can determine the match. And this is precisely the concern that four of your brother judges in an unprecedented press conference in January 2018 publicly expressed. At the time, they were alleging that then Chief Justice Deepak Mishra was allocating cases that he deemed were potentially embarrassing to the government to prefer the benches, usually presided over by Justice Arun Mishra. If the powers of the Chief Justice as master of the roster can be so easily abused, is there not a case to dilute them or amend them or review how they are handled? See, we are trying to have element of objectivity to the extent possible. Now, for instance, we have rosters which are fixed. Now, rosters which are fixed are, will say that so-and-so bench presided over by so-and-so will have these seven or eight kind of cases. So therefore, those roster and the kind of subject matter which matters will get posted before that bench are well known to people. They are in public domain. It is true that the Chief Justice has certain powers. Now, one of those powers or some of those powers are he can constitute benches of some strength, three, five, seven, whatever strength. He can not just constitute benches, he can say that who shall be forming part of that bench, which of the judges. So therefore, to certain extent, selecting a judge or judges to be forming part of certain combinations is a prerogative of the Chief Justice. So that's number two. Number three, what kind of matters to be allocated to a particular judge? Say, for instance, a particular judge may be allocated only criminal matters or tax matters predominantly or service jurisprudence matters. You are right when you say that in the public domain, it is prescribed that so-and-so judge will be, giving, will be taking these matters. But who selects that? It is, again, the Chief Justice. So, therefore, that's the third power which he has. These are powers which are, if I may use the expression, purely objective at certain level. Of course, when you select a judge, there is an element of subjectivity, so therefore it goes into that. But when you put the matters before the bench, then that element of subjectivity may come that very well this matter instead of this bench, let it be listed before the other bench. So therefore, that's the element which, with which perhaps I think the power at times the allegation is that the power has not been correctly exercised. So therefore, these are the matters in which... You began your answer, Justice Lalit, by saying that Chief Justice's attempt to exercise their powers as master of the roster with objectivity. With objectivity, of course. Let yes. me cite to you the example of Justice Ranjan Gugoi, who as master of the roster when he was Chief Justice, allowed himself to be part of a bench that heard a Complaint of sexual I, harassment I, against I, I, himself? Perhaps you are right there that uh, and on a personal note, my, my personal view is that perhaps that kind of bench should not have been constituted. But perhaps I think the Chief Justice had, had certain reasons and which he constituted. To an outsider, naturally, if you are interested in a matter, then you can never be part of the bench. So therefore, that goes as as one of the basic ideas. But he made himself uh, part of the bench. Correct. So therefore, that, that's why I said, to my mind, that was not a correct way of uh, exercising power. Absolutely. I agree with you. It was a horrible conflict of interest. But the point I'm making is that beyond the conflict of interest, this is an example of how the powers of the master of the roster can be misused by a chief justice if he wishes to do so. Should there not be some attempt at restraint to ensure even if he wants to, he can't? There is no other way possible at this juncture. Supposing, for instance, you know, Im implant the same idea of, say, say, a collegium, say, five judges deciding what kind of matters be listed before whom, it will become so unwieldy that it will be impossible for the Chief Justice to have that administrative function to be running smoothly. You've taken the words out of my mouth because I was going to say to you, not at this point, but later in the interview, now I'll say it now, that about four or five weeks, maybe six weeks ago, Justice A.P. Shah in an interview to me, when we were discussing the master of the roster, said that better than vesting the powers in an individual, the Chief Justice, 
they should be vested collectively in the top three. Oh, you are right. We are, you know, these are systems. These are we we keep on improving our model with which we are working. With our past experience experiences, there is a course correction. There is an element of to improve ourselves. So perhaps what the idea that instead of centering or concentrating the power in one individual who is the then chief justice. Perhaps I think there could be a larger body. You agree then, but which, the which can consider, which can consider. This is, I am not agreeing. I am only saying that as a suggestion. Perhaps I think this may improve the chances and will rule out any possibility of any criticism that perhaps there was a pure element of object uh, Subject uh, subjectivity in in. In designating a particular matter to be listed before a justice, A. P. Shah tells me, and I'm going by his word, that in Britain, where you have a master of the roster power, it's exercised in consultation with other judges. I think he said this is also true of Canada. In those countries, it's not become unwieldy. I admit that they don't have as many cases as the Supreme See, Court in India does. The kind of pressure that we have. Say, for instance, Canada that you named the 120 matters which are listed before a, before that the I entire understand. Supreme Court in a year. 120 we have, you know, every bench which sit Supreme Court sits in about say 14 or 15 benches. On a Monday, 60 matters will be listed before every bench, which means 900 on one single day. But you see, the reason why giving good consideration to Justice Shah's proposal, which you are willing to do, is important is that the master of the roster power is not just misused to benefit an individual as Ranjan Gogoi did, it can also be misused to benefit a government if the Chief Justice is so inclined. Until you became Chief Justice, critical matters in front of the Supreme Court that are essential to the functioning of our democracy, Article 370, electoral bonds, citizenship amendment, was simply being kicked down the road. You set up benches that heard them, but until that point of time, three years or more had lapsed and they hadn't been heard. And people were openly saying that successive chief justices were deliberately not hearing them because they were worried that the outcome could embarrass the government. Here, the master of the roster power was being used by a chief justice or a series of chief justices to give a benefit to the government. That undermines Indian justice. It will be extremely difficult for me to comment on what weighed with the early, earlier Chief Justices who were my predecessors. They may have their own reasons. I tried to open as much as possible. In the shortest possible time, 25 constitution bench matters got listed before six different constitution benches. And I applaud you for that. And that is something with which we have started. But you were the exception. Your predecessors deliberately chose not to hear now, it. Can now I quote you before it. you answer, sir? Yes, sir. Look what the Supreme Court said in the case of Article 370 when the delay in hearing the church challenge was brought up to the court. We can turn the clock back. And again, I don't want to be rude, but you know and I know that's nonsense. God can't turn the clock back. How can the Supreme Court? Again, it will be difficult for me to comment on what weighed with the then Chief Justice. All I can say is that as an individual, as a judge of the court, as the Chief Justice where certain powers got vested in me, I have tried to use those powers to the best possible way and to the best of my ability and try to see that the power fructifies or yields results which are better for the community and the society. One last point. It's not just that the master of the roster row power can be used to benefit the government. That's bad enough. It can also be used to deny citizens of India their rights to liberty. Look at the number of habeas corpus cases. And again, I'm citing Justice Ranjan Gogoi's time that were not taken up. They became infructuous as a result. And I'll quote, you to, right, you, I'll right. quote to you, sir, what Justice A.P. Shah wrote about this in the Hindu Roughly two, three months ago, he said Justice Gogoi had driven a coach and four through the centuries-old established law on habeas corpus. Now, habeas corpus determines my right to life, your right to life. I would imagine it should be the principal priority of a judge. And yet those cases weren't heard. Now, I'll give you the other example. See, death sentence matters. We say that a person who is a convict and handed down a death sentence if you allow him to languish in jail, 
without the death sentence getting executed then some of the writers and some of the philosophers have gone to the extent that you are punishing the man doubly you are putting that sword hanging on his head so every day passing day is like you know he is worrying whether what is going to be my future it's what a is living going death to be. absolutely now there are 55 death reference matters pending in supreme court there are and by the law laid down by judgment by justice nariman rohinton nariman these matters must come before a bench of 3 judges so therefore three judges 55 death reference matters and the kind of benches that we were having just about one or two benches so what will be the scenario what will be the calendar what will be the end point terminal point when these matters will get over by the time you are through with those matters 25 more matters may get added so therefore there has to be a system which takes care of these kind of matters and therefore i thought that numbers 1 to 6 courts must be three judge bench combinations because after a while if you put three four matters 10 matters before one bench they get tired of you know those matters which are death sentence matters. i don't want to flatter you but the point that follows from what you are saying is simple you thought through the problem and found a solution to expedite justice your predecessors didn't and the consequence of them not making that effort to find a solution is that justice for individual indian citizens was delayed or denied that is why so what happens in these matters is that the chief justice goes by what he considers to be the priority somebody may have a 11 judge bench combination to deal with certain issues and certain problems somebody may say that the pendency is so much you're making my point for me and i'm interrupting on purpose the chief justice goes by what he considers as priority that's why if you vest the power of the master of the roster in one individual his priority will always determine things and it may be wrong very well vest very it in well. three or I, four i i open the door for you now let me just you know <laughs> consider that see the day i took over as chief justice the day i was sworn in i had a full court meeting and so therefore i discussed the entire matter with all my colleagues all my brother and sister judges so 30 of us we deliberated on this that which are the areas where priority must be given now there are number of areas where priority had to be given for instance you know completely innocuous matters in matrimonial jurisdiction a wife and where the husband and wife don't actually sort of go along well the wife stays at a some some different place and as and when divorce petition is filed by the husband the wife seeks a transfer the such kind of transfer petitions which were lying with an interim relief of stay of proceedings were lying for two and a half years now imagine the matrimonial future of a couple they don't even know whether am i supposed to be arguing my divorce petition in delhi or in bombay or in chennai on that score the matters were pending it was the kabiga kafka novel absolutely but so you see you consulted 30 judges to determine priority surely this means it can't be really unwieldy if the chief justice is required be. to consult just be. four or five it can be and that is exactly what i did i wanted to have first hand information ideas the some of the suggestions from my colleagues which we then got translated into our listing pattern the listing patterns as well as the bench formation everything but all justice ap shah's suggestion amounts to is institutionalize the need to consult that's exactly to what priority. that's exactly what i did not just one full court meeting after that three weeks i said that let us learn from our experience and we may ch- change our which courses which is why when you hmm. did it the court functioned so well and so Absolutely. many cases were cleared and what justice ap shah is saying as a solution to all the problems we've discussed about the master of the roster powers is that institutionalize the cons- consultation so that one individual even if he's chief justice doesn't decide either the priority or the size of the bench or the composition on his own he consults two or three so that different views come in and there is a different sense of what is important and what needs to be put forward and what can be held back you do agree on that idea don't you I, basically i do agree that is exactly why i even before i started my first matter on the judicial side i had actually thought that you know let us first of all meet as colleagues all the brothers and sister judges let us have chart out a course which is the common idea 
Even after that, three weeks later, we had one more full court meeting. So in two and a half months, there have been two full court so meetings. So we have agreed on the need for the Chief Justice to institutionalize, to institutionalize consultation and when he exercises take, his powers. And to take inputs from various quarters, not just he himself. There are others. There are there are people who can give good suggestions as well. Then Justice Ralit, we've reached a point where we're saying basically the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you so much. I enjoyed the talk. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.